you think of a geneticist? What do you envision? Someone in a white lab coat um, at a lab bench with a pipette, maybe? Well, since we will be talking about genetics research a lot over the course of this semester, I want to take some time to first provide you with a bird's eye view, um, but a bird's eye overview of the vast array of research that the term genetics applies to. There are a lot of different types of genetics, and the people who use those different research approaches, they often speak somewhat different languages, and they make different kinds of assumptions. So genetics, it falls into four major categories. So one, quantitative genetics, how variation is inherited within families. We, for example, would estimate heritability, heritability analyses. Developmental genetics. This is um, when people are doing studies of how genes are expressed during development. Population genetics is the study of allele frequencies within and between populations. And genomics is the statistical analysis or uh, analyses that compare large sequences of DNA and often between different species, but not always. So some people will go into one particular kind of genetics because they're fascinated by that approach. So for example, many of the people who are in genomics have a really strong background in statistics and computer science, as those skills are essential for working with massive amounts of complex data. Researchers in developmental genetics will often be very, very skilled at the manual and chemical manipulations needed to work with living cells and embryos. These are clearly very different things. Now, another way to think about genetics is to consider what your question is, and then figure out what type of genetics approach is useful to answer that question. So for example, you want to understand why some populations tolerate lactose, but not others. Or you want to understand why so many people in your family are missing their canine teeth or you want to understand which genes cause teeth to form in the first place. Different types of genetics approaches provide you with the different kinds of information to be able to answer those research questions. So for example, if you want to know how genes do what they do, you can use quantitative genetics, developmental genetics, or genomics. Let's say you want to know how DNA sequences vary within and between populations or species, for example. You could use, or you would need to use, population genetics or genomics. So let's do a quick overview now of these four different types of genetics research. Quantitative genetics. This is the kind of genetics that um, I've mostly used in my own research. So quantitative genetics is sometimes also called statistical genetics, but that's actually, it's not quite right, since personally I rely more on maximum likelihood, which for those of you who have a background in mathematics know they aren't the same thing, and in fact they're actually kind of opposites. But anyway, but the approach um, in quantitative genetics is to work from the phenotype back to the genome. So we work with phenotypic data, phenotypic variation, that's observed in a population. So here, you were looking at the histogram of height that we looked at in module three last time, last time. Now consider all that phenotypic variation in height. So some of that variation results from people having tall or short parents, and some of that variation is due to things that happened to the person while they were growing up. Did they have a bad childhood illness that may have slowed their growth for a while? Or maybe they didn't eat a nutritious diet, either by choice or poverty, so they didn't get the opportunity to reach their full genetic height potential. Now we can take those questions and break the phenotypic variance down into a component that's due to genetic influences and a component that is due to non-genetic influences. Now you can't do this kind of analysis with just any population. You need a population in which you know all the individuals um, and how they are related to each other, so that you can have an expectation of how much you might expect them to look alike based on how closely they are related to each other. So in quantitative genetics, we look at how variation is inherited in a population for which we know all the family relationships. Quantitative genetics assesses how variation is inherited, and we do that using algorithms. 
The opposite approach is developmental genetics. So with quantitative genetics, we were using adult phenotypic variation and kind of working backwards. In developmental genetics, you are looking at an egg cell. Um, oh, actually here. So you're looking at an egg cell in this picture, and it's got sperm around it. Um, this is actually showing that moment of conception. But FYI, this is actually not a human one. Humans wouldn't look quite like this with all of those sperm around them. I forget whose sperm and egg this is. Anyway, it's a pretty picture, huh? <laughs> so in developmental genetics, the researcher is working from the genome forward through ontogeny, so forward through development. And there are a few different ways to do this. One way for a researcher to do this is to tag a bit of DNA and then watch how it is expressed during development. So much of the research in developmental genetics has been done on flies. A few different species of them are shown here to the right. Now flies are a great model system for development because they grow up so quickly. And, you know, most people don't feel as ethically concerned about manipulating fly embryos as they do with vertebrates. If you do research with vertebrates, there are many oversight steps that you go through to make sure that the work is being done humanely. But this is actually not the case with invertebrates. But to the research. So on the left side of your screen, you were looking at four kind of look like blobby ovals. And these are actually the very earliest stages of embryonic fly development. So that top oval shows an embryo that's about 100 cells long. The green, yellow, and red colors, they're marking two different genes that overlap in the middle. And they're marking the front and the back of the fly. They're, fit, they're determining which is going to be the front and which is going to be the back end. Now the next stage of embryonic development is the next oval down. So you see the stripes that go across the embryo? The stripes and the interstripes are specific gene expression patterns that are setting up what will be the segments of the fly's body. And then the next stage is marked by 14 stripes that kind of swoop around. And then within hours, the embryo has its physical segments, as you see in the bottom panel of the figure. Now when the, uh, this gives you a sense then of how genes are involved in that very early patterning of, a, of an embryo. And this is flies, but actually all animals are remarkably similar in having these same sets of genes that are setting up the polarity of the animal's body. Another approach in developmental genetics is to make a gene dysfunctional and then see what goes wrong with the development. So to demonstrate how this research is done, I'll show you a figure from a paper published in 2005 in which the authors turned off the gene F FGFR1, so fibroblast, fibroblast growth factor 1, <laughs> and they did this in a mouse. Now on the left, you are looking at what fore and hind limb development usually looks like in a mouse at 17.5 days of embryonic development. So this is basically pretty soon before they're born, when you can see the bones look like mouse bones. Now, here's what those limbs look like when FGFR1 isn't working at all. Notice that the front, the fore and the hind feet, they're both severely underdeveloped. So the conclusion is FGFR1 is essential for typical foot development. So I've added a figure now um, to the right. And in these panels, the authors tagged a few genes to show how they are usually expressed on the left, so that's the normal, the typical development, and on the right when FGFR1 isn't functioning. Now the lack of typical expression of the other genes, so SOX9 and HOXD12 and HOXD13, the lack of typical expression in those other genes and the underdeveloped feet are then interpreted to be interrelated. So these kinds of experiments are essential to figuring out how genes communicate with each other during development to make an animal, a mouse, a fly, a person. So it's a bit like figuring out a recipe when all you have are the letters of, of the recipe and a picture of the final meal. It's tricky to say the least, and you have to be very clever to do this kind of genetics. Um, but it's fascinating, isn't it? And then there are um, population genetics and genomics. The two types of genetics research that rely intensely on knowledge of base pairs in the genome. Now, the word genome refers to the complete DNA sequence of a set of chromosomes. The term comes from gene and chromosome, not surprisingly. <laughs> anyway, each human has 3.2 billion base pairs in their complete set of chromosomes. 
people typically have 46 chromosomes and they come in pairs so you have 23 pairs of chromosomes you get one part of each pair from your mother and the other part from your father now the condition of having two copies of each chromosome is what we call being diploid d-i-p-l-o-i-d diploid so many people imagine chromosomes looking like what you see here in the photograph on the right it's like two french baguettes that are tied together tightly in the middle or somewhere close to the middle anyway you know you know baguettes those are those long thin loaves of bread yeah anyway okay so this is how chromosomes look during the cell cycle when they're most condensed and therefore when they're most readily seen the confusing thing about this image though is that the chromosome has actually just replicated itself as the cell is preparing to divide into two so those X shapes, the two baguettes tied together, each is called a sister chromatid connected by a centromere, and they're duplicates of each other. Okay, a karyotype. A karyotype is when you take images of the chromosomes at this stage of the cell cycle and organize them into pairs at by size, save for the last two. So you can see a karyotype then on the sort of lower left-hand side of the screen, and notice that there are 22 chromosome pairs lined up by size followed by the 23rd pair which are the x and the y chromosomes the sex chromosomes we call those first 22 chromosomes the autosomes or the autosomal chromosomes and the x and the y are the sex chromosomes now while humans typically have 23 pairs of chromosomes there is a lot of variation in this across the animal kingdom uh, for example, chimps and baboons have 24 pairs, fruit flies have 4 pairs, Ma mice have 20, donkeys, get a load of this, have 31, and butterflies, the most magnificent of all, perhaps, if you're going off of sheer number of chromosomes, they have 190 pairs. Whoa, mind blow. <laughs> so you might have just caught something interesting there in what I said. Chimpanzees, our closest living relatives, have 24 pairs of chromosomes. So humans, if you remember, have 23. So what happened is that human chromosome 2 is a composite of two smaller chromosomes that are separate in chimpanzees, baboons, and many other primates. Well, you can see them here in this figure. So the human chromosomes, this time they're not in the sister chromatid formation, but just one chromosome by itself. The human is in yellow, lined up beside the chimpanzee chromosome in white. Remember, they're organized by size. So human chromosome 2 is the second largest. And notice that the chimpanzee side of the figure in white is actually two smaller chromosomes side by side with a little bit of partial overlap. Chromosomes consist primarily of DNA and proteins, and their structure was worked out in 1953. This is quite the science discovery story, <laughs> filled with intense international competition, backstabbing, very questionable ethics, and a few different tragic endings for those involved in very different meanings of the word tragic. By the way, hey, Rosalind Franklin's 100th birthday uh, uh, was July 20th, 2020. So happy birthday, Dr. Franklin. So I will actually drop into um, the, the Kaltura video some links to um, stories. So you can read a little bit about that um, if you are interested in some of the um, perusing some of the history to all of this. But let's think for a moment about autosomal and sex chromosomes. So you have 23 pairs of chromosomes in humans, and I mentioned briefly a few minutes ago that when an organism has two sets of chromosomes, that is called being diploid. So humans are generally diploid, except in rare occasions. Now we get one copy from mom, and the other copy comes from dad. So this then means that um, one is inherited, one set of your chromosomes is inherited from mom, the other inherited from dad and that means then the sperm and the egg cells are special and having only a half of a complete set of chromosomes the sperm and the egg cells are not diploid they are what we call haploid h-a-p-l-o-i-d haploid <laughs>
Okay, let's do a little concept check for you here. Okay, so gametes are the cells in your body that form sperm or egg cells, the germ lines, and all of the others are called somatic cells. How many chromosomes are in one skin cell of a human male? How many chromosomes are in one skin cell of a human male? I hope you got that. 46. So only the egg and the sperm cells have 23 that are, are the, the haploid condition. Everything else is diploid. So now DNA. DNA is really, really small. <laughs> the reason that it's so hard um, to see, except when it's all tightly coiled up together during that one stage of the cell cycle, um, the karyotype that we were talking about before, this is because it's so small. The double helical structure that was worked out in 1953 is wound around proteins and round around and wound around. And so if you, if you unspool all of it, the DNA in one human cell would stretch out to be two meters long. One cell, two meters long. Now, since there are 10 to the 14th cells in your body, that means 100 trillion cells, if you stretched out all of your DNA from end to end and you just glued the little ends together, it would extend from the sun all the way to Uranus, the planet. It's pretty spectacular. That's a lot of information, a lot of DNA in your body. Now I'm going to let you explore the structure of DNA and the nucleotide pairs through the resources provided by Cold Spring Harbor. You should have already actually checked these out in Experience 1 for this module, but if you missed that, go back and check it out. We will move forward with the semester assuming that these terms and concepts are familiar to you. Now, while the double helical structure of DNA was worked out in 1953, the actual sequencing of those base pairs, the A, T, C's, and G's, that didn't come for another 50 years. The technological hurdles, the technological hurdles working out the full human genome sequence were immense. It took a massive public-private partnership to ultimately get it all done. Now, the effort began in earnest in 1999, but the over, and the overall cost to sequence just one human genome ended up being $2.7 billion, which at 3.2 billion base pairs comes to about 84 cents per base pair. <laughs> now the technological advances of that endeavor, such as figuring out how to store and organize, needless to say, analyze all that data, that then facilitated the sequencing of many other genomes of other organisms and other people. The public side of that partnership was done by the National Institutes of Health, and I want to introduce you to this man, Francis Collins, who directs the National Institutes of Health, the NIH. He oversaw the Human Genome Project, and he still advocates for lots and lots of the biological research that is done in the United States. NIH started in 1938 with the National Cancer Institute, and it's grown now so that there are 26 separate appropriations, 26 separate institutes within NIH. Now more than 80% of the NIH's funding is awarded through almost 50,000 competitive grants to more than 300,000 researchers at more than 2,500 universities, medical schools, and other research institute institutions in every state um, and around the world. And Berkeley, UC Berkeley, has quite a few of those because we have a spectacular biological research uh, group here on campus. Now, about 10% of NIH's budget also supports projects conducted by about 6,000 scientists in its own laboratories. So that has a campus in Bethesda, Maryland, where they actually have people doing research in laboratories working specifically for NIH. Okay, so to give you a sense of the scope of biological research in, in the United States, the, the NIH, the research that is being funded by the United States government, the NIH's budget for, two, for the year 2000 was $18 billion, and in 2018, it was, um, 2010, it was $31 billion, and in 2018, it's 30, it was $37 billion. Now there's also some biology research that's funded through the National Science Foundation, or NSF, 
but that institution's budget is much smaller. And for example, in 2015, it was $7.3 billion. Now, my research is primarily funded by NSF, since my science is more on the exploratory side of biology than on the medical question-driven side of biology. Now, this may seem like an awful lot of money, and it is an awful lot of money, but it's all relative, right? So, to put it into some perspective, NIH received just 0.008% of the federal budget in 2012. So, and this is really only about 3% of what our country spends on defense. Now, I also wanted to introduce you to Francis Collins for another reason. I mentioned him back in module two when we talked about religion and evolution. Director Collins wrote a book in, 20, in 2006 about his religious beliefs and how his identification his identifying as a Christian meshes with his science, and, it, and it's well worth checking out if you are mulling over these topics yourself. Now, the Human Genome Project, it was huge, <laughs> and it's kind of funny, though, to think about how expensive it was, and nowadays it costs less than $1,000 to sequence someone's genome, which means that we can look at genetic variation across... Oops, hold, hold on, sorry means that we can look at genetic variation across the entire genome um, for a lot of different people and compare them. So one of the things I want to point out, though, is that so much more was learned than just sequences of genomes. Um, this is why the federal government invested so much money in it. Figuring out how to do the project was technologically and scientifically just as valuable as was the accomplishment. Kind of much like the mission to, um, to take someone to the moon, it's the process that is perhaps even more valuable to our technological development as a country. Now from the perspective of this class, where our questions revolve around human variation, the ability to then sequence many other human, human genomes has revealed a lot about the genetic variation in our species. By sequencing many human genomes, we have learned that the genome sequence is almost exactly the same, 99.9% .9 in all people. We've learned there are about 1.4 million locations where single base differences, DNA differences, what we call SNPs, single nucleotide differences, um, occur in humans. Out of 3 billion base pairs, there isn't a lot of variation between individual humans. And we've also learned that the order of almost all nucleotide bases is exactly the same in all humans. We're going to come back to that. Hold all of that in your mind for a little bit later in this module. Okay, if you think back to the start of this video, I mentioned that genomics could also be used to study how genes do what they do. Let's explore that for a few minutes. You've already refreshed your memory on transcription and translation, so now we will think about DNA sequence in terms of whether or not it's being translated into a protein. Now remember, genes code for proteins. Now, approximately 20,000 to 25,000 genes in the human genome, um, there are approximately 20 to 25,000 genes in the human genome, and that means that thinking about the 3.2 billion base pairs, that only about 2% of the human genome consists of protein coding sequence. Only 2%. So what had happened for a long time, once, once geneticists, biologists figured this out, just how, how what a small proportion of, a, of the human genome account um, actually codes for proteins, is they started saying, oh, the rest of it just must be junk. It must, must not be doing anything. It's just hanging out. <coughs> <clears throat> going for an evolutionary ride. But then we started to realize that regions of the gene that the regions of the genome that weren't being translated into proteins it's actually still doing things. Perhaps as much as 80% of the genome contains elements linked to biochemical functions. So it just doesn't seem to be true that most of the human genome is junk DNA. Now, many of those regions are regulating when and in what quantities proteins are being synthesized by that 
again, so 20 to 25,000 genes. Now we get, which is actually not that many. So you know, if we try to do like a one-to-one -one relationship between a, a gene and something on your body, that's it's just not enough genes to account for all of the things that your body does. So what happens is that we get the vast array of the things our body does from this pretty limited number of proteins by having them turn on and off and be expressed to different, different degrees. So they're turned on and off at different times and different combinations, and they're expressed to different, um, different levels. Regions of DNA um, that control this are called regulatory elements. Regulatory elements do this. Now, a good way to think about regulatory elements is as little DNA sequences that are upstream of the protein coding regions. And depending on what the regulatory element codes for, gene A may only be turned on at one particular time in development, and then it isn't expressed at all for the rest of your life. Or gene B might be turned on simultaneously with gene A in some animals, but sequentially in other animals. A neat example of this is in the wings of these flies. Now you saw these earlier in the video. Now I want to draw your attention to their wings. Notice that the fly at the top has no pigment in its wings. The fly in the middle has a little patch just at the wing tips. And the fly at the bottom has polka dots. So the same exact gene is responsible for the pigmentation pattern in all three flies. The only thing that differs between them is the regulatory element that turns that gene on and off. <laughs> but the regulatory element isn't a protein coding region. It, it regulates proteins. It doesn't encode a protein. Kind of cool, eh? <laughs> I want to take the last few minutes of this video to add one more important concept to the mix, genetic mutations. As you know from thinking about transcription, DNA replication is, generally speaking, incredibly faithful. The structure of DNA and the use of the four nucleotides means that the sequence of DNA is very, very stable. It is replicated faithfully, but not always. And that's the essential thing for evolution to work. If there aren't mutations, you don't get any new variation. But too many mutations and the whole thing breaks down. So there's this sweet spot for genetic mutations and evolution. Mutations arise primarily through the process of cell replication. When DNA is replicating itself, the DNA condenses into the chromatids, which you saw earlier, replicates to sister chromatids, and then the cell divides into two, pulling those sister chromatids apart. In the process of mitosis, a diploid cell divides into two diploid cells. Now remember, diploid means that there are two of each chromosome. This is how the vast majority of cells duplicate themselves. But then there is meiosis. Okay, quick review of mitosis. Parent cell, DNA replicates, two daughter cells form, each are diploid. While most cells divide through the process of mitosis, there is a very special exception to this, and that type of replication we call meiosis. And this is where, um, at the beginning part of the process, things are the same. They look the same. The parent cell duplicates, it replicates its DNA, two daughter cells form, both are diploid because, um, because they then um, pulled the sister chromatids apart, but then, drum roll for emphasis, they split again. <laughs> in meiosis, a diploid cell replicates its DNA, splits into two diploid cells, and then divides again to form four haploid cells. Haploid means that the cell has a single set of chromosomes. <coughs> Excuse me. So mitosis is when you form a clone, and meiosis is when you go from a diploid cell to haploid cells. One of these really special cool things is happening during meiosis, though, and this is recombination. Recombination. <laughs> during recombination, segments of DNA get shuffled around, so the two chromosomes, they swap sections, creating a mixture of the two. So as you can see in this figure, 
you have a set of light gray chromosomes from mom and a set of red chromosomes from dad. They replicate and have the sister chromatids hooked to each other. And then, boom, recombination. The daughter cells are then diploid. But they are diploid with a mix-up of the mom and dad chromosomes because of recombination. They then divide again, and you have four diploid cells, each with just one set of chromosomes. And each of those chromosomes is a smash-up of mom and dad's chromosomes. New genetic configurations, new genetic variation. <laughs> Actually, a funny little story here. So when, when my husband and I were talking about whether or not maybe we should have a child, um, he was a little concerned because he's like, you know, I like myself and I really like you, but, you know, recombination can be a really scary thing. <laughs> it worked out really well, though. Anyway, okay, so have you figured out what the special circumstances are yet for meiosis? That's right, the formation of sperm and egg cells, what we call spermatogenesis and oogenesis. And we'll talk more about that towards the end of this semester. But for now, meiosis is special for sex, and sex is a great thing in evolution, not just because, well, because of some obvious things that probably come to mind, but because it generates new genetic combinations and variation. But of course, things can always go wrong. <laughs> so genetic mutations, um, be sure to check out these different types of genetic mutations and the resources provided for Experience 1 for this module. Recombination is super important for adding in genetic variation, but all of these are essential too. So calculating mutation rate overall is it's kind of a, a bit more complicated than it might seem like it should be, but recent estimates for hominids suggest that each nucleotide mutation um, occurs once every 500,000 million years. It's insane. But think about it, it's like each of those base pairs, of the 3.2 billion base pairs, they only mutate that infrequently. <laughs> but these little mutations where one base pair gets misread and a different base pair is inserted into the sequence, or a base pair is overlooked and missed, these mutations, the nonsense, missense, silent, and frame shift, frame shift mutations, are really important to many of the phenotypes that we will talk about this semester. But first, we are going to think about these mutations another way, not in terms of the phenotypic effects, but for what they can tell us about human evolution. We are going to use these types of mutations to test these two hypotheses, multi-regionalism and the replacement model. So for this part of our evolutionary history, you'll see that genetic evidence actually can weigh in on this better than the skeletal evidence can. So next time, we will look at human diaspora as recorded on our DNA, and I'll show you how we figured out that we're all African. <laughs>